the big British castle. It's time for Adam and Joe to broadcast on the radio. There'll be some music and some random talking in between. And then eventually the whole thing will just end. Uh, that's uh, the Smiths with this charming man. Hey, how you doing, listeners? Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. I'm Adam Buxton. Hello, I am Joe Cornish. Hello, Hello Cornish. I am Joe Cornish. Joe Cornish, off mic. How are you doing, man? Joe's a little upset because someone's got control of his computer screen. It's all going wrong this morning. Someone's got control it's of like, my screen. It's like Mission Impossible. It's taken over! Tom Cruise has got control of Cornballs' his computer I'm sure screen. it'll be sorted out. And a special good morning to Black Squadron, the country's uh, most physically attractive fighting force. Let's uh, stand the squadron to attention with the following jungle. Black Squadron! Always catch the beginning of the show. Black Squadron don't want to miss a thing. That's not the way Black Squadron rolls. Went to bed at a reasonable hour. Gotta be sharp on Saturday morning. That's the secret of the Squadron's power. Black Squadron! Now, the reason Black Squadron are one of the countries, well, I say one of, are the country's most physically attractive fighting forces because they are now after... 12 weeks of commands. Mm. They're very toned. Sure they are. Beautifully. Not not over-the-top musculature. No. But just not lovely. Not grotesque. Not grotesque. Just very shapely. And this week, uh, Black Squadron, we're going to give you a command that evokes one of the most dangerous periods of rock history. Sure. One of the most rebellious and edgy periods of rock history. We've thought about this a lot. It's not easy formulating commands for the squadron, is it? Because... Mm. When you're thinking about the big British castle guidelines, the things that you don't want to encourage people to do, the things that people might do because they're so enthusiastic that they cause harm to themselves mm -hmm. and others around them, <laughs> you've really got to be careful. You've got to be careful. So when you hear this Black Squadron command, don't do anything naughty. No. Don't make any rude signs at the camera. Don't make any rude, uh, politically inflammatory signs. Don't hurt anyone. Don't put any safety pins in, in difficult places. <laughs> the way you can't get them out again or you have to go to A&E afterwards. We don't want anyone to finish the show in A&E because of the Black Squadron command. So take care, Squadroners. When when you hear the command, you'll wonder why we're saying all this. Yeah, exactly. It's quite tame, really. <laughs> well, it depends how you interpret it, isn't it? What is the Black... What, what, who are Black Squadron? What is the Black Squadron command? Well, the Black Squadron command is a way of challenging the elite listening force, the squadron that listens to this show live every 10 o'clock to 10.30. That is the Black Squadron period. You're not really a squadron member if you listen to the show outside of that period. You're a lazy squadron. And if you are able to, you have to take a picture of yourself as soon as Commander Cornballs issues the command and then send it in to the following email address, which is adamandjoe.sixmusic at bbc.co.uk. adamandjoe.sixmusic at bbc.co.uk. You could also text your picture to 64046 texts will be charged at your standard message rate and um we will put some of the best of the photographs on our blog afterwards just to warn you so you know. we should really be playing a record in the style of the command it, are we yeah oh. he's on top of it he's on top of it James okay is a proper producer he's been doing this for many weeks stand by black squadron <laughs> here we go with your command the text number 64046 for your photos this week's black squadron command is Punk! Oh dear. There's a little raspberry at the end there. There's not too many songs that end with a raspberry, are there? That's a good one, though, isn't it? Did you ever have a punk phase, Joseph Cornish? Not really, no. No, I was a bit too young for punk. I was, that was during the Silver Jubilee and stuff. I was being very uh, patriotic and monarchistic and wearing lots of Union Jack badges and going to street parties. Same here, I was... Di Certainly was not being a punk. I wasn't jumping about being rude <laughs> about the Queen. Why, 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 why would I want to do that? Why be any different? I was uh, enjoying my Jubilee mug, which I still have on mm -hmm. the shelf, along with my Charles and Di... Well, you've got a very big pot. collection of royal memorabilia. Sure I do. The listeners would be surprised if they walked into your front room. It's completely decked out <laughs> <laughs> with Union Jacks, Kate and Wills, yeah. Fergie and what's-his-face... And Tom. Charles and Di stuff. Yeah. Jubilee, Golden Jubilee, Queen Mum. You love them. Absolutely love them. Can't get enough of them. Laura, Laura, <laughs> memorabilia. You're royalty obsessed. Yeah. But on the flip side of that, the Black Squadron Command was punk and squadron. I, I don't know what's going on. We've only had... T oh, no, here we go. There's a third. Oh, actually, we've just refreshed and things have got better. It started out quite badly. Look at that, man. 
Is What's that he doing? today? Hey, that's good. That's art. He's got clips on him, and he's got... What sort of clips are they? They're like blue plastic clothes pegs. He's got he's fancy clothes all, pegs. all over his face, literally. So he's like a human porcupine. They're on his nose, his lips, his nostrils, his ears, <laughs> and his hair. He's suffering for his squadron. That's very good. There's a gentleman... Oh, that's very good, isn't it? A gentleman or a lady. Possibly a lady, I guess. Who already has a nose ring, and she simply put a safety pin into the nose ring. That's a way of, like, piercing herself without actually, you know, compromising her skin. There's quite a scary-looking man flicking a V-sign, and he doesn't appear to be wearing clothes. It's the top part. He looks like... That can't be published. That V-sign is too uh, naughty for the, too, yeah, for the castle. Naughty. That's naughty. That would outrage people if like, we posted that. He looks like Vinnie Jones, that geezer. Mmm. That man's just wearing a T-shirt saying punk. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty good. Well, keep the pictures coming in, Black Squadron. There's um, some very creative interpretations. <laughs> you know, speaking of the royal family, as we were just then, I found myself in a strange position the other day. Someone, uh, not, had, uh, yeah, on. no, the, the other mm. position. I had, uh, I was round for lunch at someone's house, and they had that book of photographs where they've, you know, they've got doubles for the royal family. Yeah. And uh, they're taking pictures of them in shocking positions and stuff, doing naughty things. What's the name of that lady who does those? Oh. Alison. Yeah. I've got a mug by her. It's an Alison. Um, and anyway, they were, they were flicking through that. And one of the pictures was, and everyone was kind of passing the book round and <laughs> chuckling at it and stuff. <laughs> and, uh, one of the pictures. It sounds like a marvelous dinner party. <laughs> well, it was, you know, it, it was. was, it was one of those things where I don't know if you, I'm sure you do get this actually, Joe, but, um, everyone is getting so into something and enjoying it so much. You think I'm going to rain on this parade. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking to scornballs. <laughs> exactly. What do you mean? That's my MO. That's right. I th I'm going to think, what would Joe do? I know, he'd get a little bucket of scorn. He'd, <laughs> he'd pour it on that book. <laughs> so That's I, not what I do. So I thought, I'm going to do that too. So I got out my scorn bucket. And when the book came round to me, I found this, one of the photographs was they'd mocked up the doubles of Wills and Kate out in Africa. And Wills and Kate were wandering along hand in hand um, in their nice clothing, looking happy. And in the background, <clears throat> there were loads of uh, African people, like uh, tribes people dressed up in tribal gear, carrying Wills and Kate's luggage, you know, like right. loads and loads of their luggage. And, I get and, it. And looking sort of exhausted. And I just thought, that is beyond the pale because i don't think wills and kate would do that i don't mm. think mm. that they would walk along there and let someone else carry their luggage in that way whether they were in africa or any other part of the world and i found like what started out being a bit of scorn pouring ended up being just me defending <laughs> the royal family against mm. accusations and that it's happening again in a way it is because i'm broadcasting <laughs> it aren't I? on a radio program I forgot about that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I better do a free play. Uh, here's Emmy the Great, and we love Emmy the Great on this program. We do love Emmy the Great. We were introduced to her and her lovely world, I guess thanks to our producer James, who um, got her along to one of our Glastonbury shows a few years back, and she sang for us live then. I hope she's going to do the same next weekend when we're in Glastonbury, because Emmy the Great is playing. Uh, Emmy the Great is the name of her band, Emmy herself is called Emily Moss, and her new album is called Virtue. This is a track called Dinosaur Sex. <laughs> Steady. And it's um, beautifully produced, and uh, <laughs> it's about... What are you chuckling at? Nothing. You're, You're sounding, sounding like, like your dad. You're sounding like your dad. Oh, am I? <laughs> it's beautifully produced. <laughs> Absolutely beautifully produced. The sounds are wonderful. It's about the apocalypse, fear of the apocalypse, Joe. Sure it is. Yeah, here it is. Dinosaur Sex. This is Emmy the Great. Minnie Ripperton. She's absolutely ripped. She's got mini Rippertons. Yeah. Listen, uh, Black Squadron, you've done an extraordinary job with this command this morning. Well done, uh, all of you, particularly Rowan Smith, who has sort of used onion rings and a bit of popcorn to create some piercings. Yeah. Is that an onion ring? I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> it's snaking in and out of his mouth like two vampire teeth that are conjoined what is it let's have a look is it and a then sausage? he's put a piece of it's not a sausage what kind of sausages do you eat really circular ones yeah thin round well, sausages can you get round they... sausages yeah well they when they hang no, them up can't. in shops like they tie them oh, together that's true yeah like to have a completely circular. versed 
Brad Verst. That's very good. Rowan, uh, Tom in Cheltenham was the gentleman with the hundreds of blue plastic clothes pegs. Simon Pegg. He's suffered a great deal. He's got a bulgy eye look, but I can assume that is the pain causing that. Yeah. Claire and Andrew McCluskey. Have we featured them before? I think we might have, but they've done a very good job with uh, bin bag dresses. Bin bags. That was an earlier squadron command there coming back into play. Do you remember yeah. that? That's right. Bin bag dress. It's not a practical way of dressing. I mean, that's the thing about the punks, uh, is that they smelled bad, because mm. if you wear well, bin they bags... Didn't care. They didn't care. I know they didn't care. care. That wasn't the point. No. But it was a very uncomfortable time oh, for fun. young people. You fun think it was fun? Filthy. Yeah, but no, sweaty as well. Oof. Anyway, Claire and Andrew are doing very good. I mean, Andrew's got a very, very rebellious face there. He's cocking a, a snoop or a snook. A snook. snook. He's would, cocking a snoop and I would a snook. say a, a snook. And uh, Claire there, she's looking very grumpy and belligerent. Yeah, she doesn't want to do what she she's told. Want, no, she's going to do the opposite of what she's told, like, yeah. like Colin Farrell. Exactly. Um, there's Ewan, <laughs> and Ewan's just put a big furry um, cushion on his head to create the illusion of a punk haircut. Spiky haircut. He's very good. Did you watch that documentary about the history of festivals last night? I'm sure it was a repeat. Yeah, I did, yeah. It was quite good, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> he did, and Adam's like, he didn't watch it. I it was on BBC it. Four, it was very good. Some of you listeners out there might have seen it. It was about the history of free festivals. It mainly made me think, every single festival they covered, I just thought, oh, glad I wasn't there. Did you watch it? <laughs> yeah, you did, did watch yeah. it. I get very mixed signals from you this I morning. I saw Jeremy Beadle there in it. But that was good, but the point <clears> is, the punks ruined it. The punks came along and ruined it. It was all going the swimmingly. Punks. Yeah. They came along and ruined it with their shouting and spitting. The hippies ruined it. No, actually, the cops ruined it. The cops oh, ruined it Everyone first. ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's always going to ruin anyway, it. Anyway, well done, Black Squadron. That's a terrific response. Watch out for the very best of those photos uh, up on the Adam and Joe blog, bbc.co.uk forward slash blogs forward slash Adam and Joe. They'll be there later in the day, but not if you flicked a rude sign at the camera or <laughs> did anything that isn't family friendly. Exactly. Because this is sort of uh, family friendly punks, isn't it? Yeah, it's like the kids show. Anodyne punks. Yeah. <laughs> Pretend punks. Part-time punks. Um, Kaiser Chief news, ladies and gentlemen. The Kaisers are back, and as far as I know, they're doing something like... They've uploaded a load of tracks, 20 tracks or something. You can download them from their website, and then at some point they will decide which ones are the public's favourites, and then maybe those will be compiled onto an official album release. Isn't that putting the cart before the horse? You can't just do let the public decide can you you have to tell the public well if there are more tracks online than there are on the album then then won't you just miss the tracks that aren't on the album on the album i Do think you know it's I mean? up to the band to say this is what you're getting enjoy it or don't oh, that's right. the album deal with it you know there's all this democracy of the web i don't i don't know <laughs> anyway having said all that enjoy this <laughs> i'm not saying anything about the songs i'm sure they're great this is little shock i've not heard this one before i think it's probably brilliant it's the kaiser chiefs with little shock <laughs> Exploring new sonic territory there. That's the Kaiser Chiefs with little shocks. Fantastic sounds here on BBC Six Music. That's my new voice. I'm going to do the rest of the show like that. Quickly, news. Okay, we've got to stand the squadron down first. Okay. Stand down, your work is done. You've earned yourself a nice warm bath and maybe a nice little bun. It's 10.31 and 30 seconds. It's time for the news. Yeah, staying a little bit punky there with Richard Hell and the Voidoids and Blank Generation. This is Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. How are you doing, listeners? Yeah, you okay? You well? Good. It's a little bit sunny here in London. Hope it's nice where you are. I got absolutely soaked on my bike yesterday. Went to the steam fair. Didn't see you at the steam fair, Joe Cornballs. No, I'm sorry, I did explain to Mr Cocker yeah. that I wouldn't be able to attend because I was otherwise engaged. Uh, it was was it the, good fun? For the National Autistic Society, we were down there in, in uh, London in Fulham. It was fun, but it, I mean, it was really rainy. It was kind of unfair <laughs> yeah, mm. how rainy it was, and I felt sorry for the organisers. But still, uh, everyone turned up. Harry Hill turned up, and Jonathan Ross, and Jarvis, and they were all there, and lots of very nice people. Very nice to meet you if you were there yesterday. So it was fun, and it's a great fair, the, those Carter Steam Fair places. Why are you smiling? I'm smiling. I'm reading one of these retro text donations. I'm just chortling yeah. about the fun that's to come. Yeah. That sounded like hospital radio with me <laughs> saying it's a great fair. 
<laughs> it's an absolutely great fair. It's a terrific you know, fair. Because they're all antique uh, steam engines, and some of them are beautiful. The way they're kept is absolutely marvellous, and the uh, uh, paint... <laughs> <laughs> I, I like the noise better. Uh, uh, now that's radio. Uh, Listen, it's Retro Text the Nation time. Retro Text the Nation. Are you re- were you ready for that? Yeah. I was, yeah. I was just going to do it. Uh, <laughs> oh, well, don't. Um, uh, no, go on to, uh, Okay. Uh, uh, it's Retro Text the Nation time. This is the time when people who listen to the show via the podcast or via Listen Again can contribute to the previous week's Text the Nation, if that's clear. That's why it's called Retro Text the Nation. And, of course, uh, just to be serious for a moment, um, <laughs> this... <we> <laughs> This section of the show does uh, have one of the most <laughs> incredible jingles ever. Ever, no, hang on. I think it's. I think it's actually the uh, most <laughs> the, the, the amazing jingle ever written. And um, I wrote it. And when I wrote it, <laughs> you wrote it. Uh, I did write it. It's when I wrote it, right. I just didn't. I just had no idea. Yeah. I had no idea. I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, I had no idea I was writing the greatest jingle but but yeah. you don't and i was talking to paul mccartney the other day and i was asking him whether he knew when he wrote some of those songs that they were what they were and, and he said no and and that's you know and mm. i said no uh, i said it's amazing because i didn't feel it either and um we got on really well yeah yeah and i'm, I'm you're talking, he was talking about yesterday and you were saying well yes retro text nation is mm, the yesterday mm, of jingles. that is but he brought it up I, there's no way i would have started that conversation sure. but he he brought it up it's the most covered jingle i'm sorry mm. to say mm. uh here is a message from nicholas Cecil Montgomery Ward the yes. third, a yes, male he's man. Very, he's very clever from Chelmsford in mm. Essex. Perceptive man. He says, "Dear Professor Buxopheles and Doctor Cornucopia, uh, my friend David works as an archivist at the Big British Castle, and he's recently discovered a remarkable and previously unheard demo recording of the Beatles from 1962 talking about Macca. However, I feel that this startling discovery may help to redress the animosity felt." by adam around the ongoing popularity of the retro text the nation jingle well let's have a look and uh, or even a listen and see what he's on about well, I, I used to listen to adam and joe but i listened to the podcast and not the live show i used to feel acute frustration yeah I mean, that's very amusing, but that's not the Beatles. Is it not? No, that's fake. <laughs> I mean, because I just wouldn't want you to diminish my true story about meeting Paul McCartney and us yeah, chatting yeah. with some bit of fake fakery. I mean, it's very good fake. Well done. Well done, Nicholas, beautiful. Nicholas Ward. Thank you so much for that. Although, you know, I don't think the Beatles ever did have a phase where they sang in broad Liverpudlian accents. I'm not sure about that. A Beatles expert could tell me. But let's get into Retro Texanation. Last week, we were talking about domestic decoration differences, the triple D, that divides so many happy households. You're in there, you're cohabiting with your partner or your wife or whoever you're cohabiting with. And... (laughs) (laughs) What's going on this morning? I don't know. It's like, now that's what I call (laughs) DJ voices. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> We've had everyone from your dad yeah. through to some kind of Radio 1 DJ now. What are we? Um, Hospital radio. I don't know. I'm someone who says yeah instead of your. <laughs> <laughs> I'm your, I'm your kind of uh, daytime, your fun DJ. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, your DJ who says yeah in front of a lot of your things. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> domestic <laughs> decorating difference. In front of a lot of your things. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's when you have a massive argument with your partner about, uh, <laughs> about how you're going to decorate your house. <laughs> is that clear enough um here we go i'll start you off with one here is a message from this link's gonna go on forever it's been going on for about five minutes already and we haven't even read one single message (laughs) here's one from afi he's a mailman 
though mistakenly, uh, though recently mistaken for a woman by Joe, he says. He's in uh, Bournemouth, I guess. Afi must have mailed in before. Good story. Fun story. Uh, he says, Dear Buckles and Corn Nuts, some time ago I mentioned to an old lady friend that having recently used the bathroom at my parents' house, which is carpeted, I found it very cosy, and I would like to have a, a carpeted bathroom myself in the next place I lived. She found the idea appalling and unhygienic, mm. claiming that bath water would spill out onto the carpet and that men often miss the bill when mm -hmm. urinating. Uh, I told her that this was nonsense. Nonsense! Nonsense! And that I never missed the bowl whilst sober or otherwise. And she had been influenced by television into believing that this was a common occurrence. I also told her that at any rate you can put down mats around the toilet or bath, which can then be washed. But she wouldn't budge. She even told me that it would be a deal breaker if we moved in together. Mm -hmm. I found her vehement reaction quite surprising. So I took to asking people I know about their feelings on the carpet in the bathroom. To my surprise, no one backed me. And everyone agreed that her bathroom carpeting... Uh, everyone agreed with her that bathroom carpeting is not a good idea, leaving me feel, feeling isolated and unsure of myself. <laughs> is there something wrong with me? Uh, yes. Let's move on. Yes, there is something wrong with him. You're not going for the carpeting in the bathroom? No. No, who would? You'd have who to be would? mental. You want a you want a wipe clean surface. Of course you, you do. don't want a spongy surface yeah. that can absorb liquids and hairs <laughs> and munch. <laughs> what? That's one of your words, isn't it? No, it certainly isn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, that yeah. So he's on his own. But listen, don't feel isolated. What's his name? <laughs> Affy. Affy. I'm sure there's a there's a stinky woman out there for you. <laughs> uh, here's one from Megan from Australia. Oh, mate. mate. Uh, dear Adam and Joe. That's good, isn't it? Where's nice, the nice accent, mate? Well, I'm, I'm not... Uh, shall I read no, that? No, you don't have to. No, it's okay. disrespectful. <clears throat> My friend recently moved out with her boyfriend into a new apartment. All right, I'm going <laughs> to... <laughs> My friend recently moved out with her boyfriend into a new apartment. The place didn't come with curtains, so her boyfriend decided to hang his many football scarves over the windows. He thought it looked so good that they should stay there permanently so they wouldn't need to buy curtains. Mate... A great idea, football scarves, nice backlit. Dear mate, lovely. This obviously caused an argument, which my friend somehow lost when the plumber came over and said it looked awesome. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> it's it's absolutely, it's absolutely hideous. Lots of love from Megan. Megan, why are you? Why? Why is the plumber settling the arguments? Well, because he's a plumber, right? Uh, he has very uh, earthy skills. Yeah, you need an objective eye sometimes. Exactly, you? but you can't have the arguments settled by someone who doesn't even live in the place. Football scarves for curtains—that sounds atrocious. They're sort of—they'd be illuminated on a sunny day. Yeah, that's an absolutely rotten idea. It is. Uh, here is a. Um message right now from andy in cheltenham hey andy how you doing he says hello captain buckinghamshire and lord cornwallium christ <laughs> 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 i work for one of the uk's largest building societies and a few years back they had an advertising campaign i was forcibly selected as the staff member to star in this campaign which consisted of my massive head and shoulders and face taking up a whole poster with the tagline come in and talk to me about savings this was shown around the whole branch network and with and my face was on nearly every high street in the south of england it's long over now and i managed to uh, swipe a few of the massive posters but my fiance will not let me put up the poster as the main centerpiece of the wall in our living room i insist on putting it up when we have friends and family round but you have to understand this is in a self-mocking postmodern ironic style and definitely not a vanity thing. It collects dust now behind the sofa, and whenever it comes out, I get a look as if to say, put that up and I will surgically remove your cornballs. Please, will you tell my fiancé that this is a healthy and perfectly fine object to display in the living room to settle all future disputes? We're getting married in two weeks. This needs to be settled before the marriage can take place, in my opinion. Love you, bye! I mean, he's got a giant poster of himself. That's Surely you're allowed that in the front room. I would allow that. Not everybody has a giant poster of themselves. Well, exactly. So there you go. We've we've decreed that he's right. He's allowed to have it. You know, come and talk to me about savings. Certainly I will. I mean, that's great. Okay? So I, I would say to your uh, soon-to-be lady wife, Andy, deal with it! Let's have a record. We might do some more after this record. Um, let's have some music. Yeah, this is Coldplay. I don't know if you've heard of them. No? Uh, they're a new band. They're very exciting. And they play very edgy kind of thrash 
and mm. um, thrash metal. Oh, and, I don't think I'm going to like it. Well, I think it's uh, it's a fun sound. Here's ear, every teardrop is a waterfall. Mm. Coldplay, every teardrop is a waterfall. You can listen again to uh, Will Champion from Coldplay, who was on Steve Lamack's Wednesday show here on Six Music. He, they were talking about the, the band's love of Glastonbury, which is good because they're playing there next weekend. So, you know, if they were talking about how much they loathed Glastonbury and everything about it and how uncomfortable it was and miserable, it would be a bit of a drag before they headlined there, don't you think? Yes. Um, what's the weather going to be like, James? Good. Yeah. Do you reckon? Yeah. I, heard changeable. I heard changeable. I heard changeable. Tuesday. It gets better. Oh, this week. Yeah. Right, not the week after. <laughs> yeah. Uh, changeable. Well, it's always changeable. There's going to be a few spits and spots and showers. Changeable. Showers and flowers. But um, it's not going to be the heat wave that it was last year, I guess. But as long as it's not a deluge. I loathe the deluge. Hey, should we pop back into Retro Texanation just for a little bit? We got a couple of goodies. Some of my favourites are people who have huge, awful objects in their houses that yeah. their partners can't live with. For instance, David, he sent us a picture of his barbecue. And to describe his barbecue, he's got kind of fake skulls, human skulls. Plaster skulls. Plaster yeah. skulls. He's piled them up as if some terrible atrocity has happened and mm. poured concrete over them very thick concrete it's a sort of a goth barbecue yes almost like a sacrificial altar it's a little like um something they would have had in indiana jones in the temple of doom yes uh and david says dear adam and joe here's a picture of my barbecue it's made of human skulls spelt s-c-u-l-l-s brackets not <laughs> real my wife doesn't really like it i made it while she was away it's made of concrete it's totally indestructible and immovable and we don't have friends around for barbecues anymore I love you, David. Kiss, kiss, kiss. <laughs> oh, imagine the surprise his wife got when she. <laughs> I love. I think that's the key. Is if you're going to have a controversial object in your house, <laughs> install it while your partner's away and pour concrete over it. Yeah. Make sure it's fused to the ground with thick concrete. Do you think uh, that when she got back, he immediately said, "Hey, come and look at this," or do you think he thought, "I'm going to be in trouble. I won't mention it just yet. I'll wait for her to find it." I mean, either way, it would have gone badly. I'd like to go for a barbecue at David's house. Imagine the nudity. And, well, it, it would be good if he did the barbecue sort of stripped to the waist with his body oiled. You know what I mean? A bit like the guy in the pirate uh, anti-piracy commercial. Yes. Um, who's uh, in his... Yeah, um, and once you'd had forge. your allocated um, hot dog, mm. you would be branded with a small symbol on your forehead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you couldn't have seconds. That's right. Uh, we got a message from Emma Brown. Bromley, she says, Dear Adam and Joe, keeping it straight and formal. Good. Yeah. Every now and again, that's nice just to be it's refreshing. A bit refreshing and respectful. A few years ago, my husband got drunk and bought a three, <laughs> <laughs> bought a three foot high stuffed beaver, which now stands in our front room. Uh, you know, you can look at this, you can look at our beaver on uh, Twitter at BBC Adam and Joe is our Twitter address. Uh, she continues. I have tolerated it for a number of years, but now we have children, I feel it has become a bit of a health hazard, especially the pointy claws that are just about toddler eye height. I'm formulating a plan to banish it to the loft, where it'll join the set of Queen Russian Dolls. That is the band, Queen. Set of Russian Dolls of Queen. Goodness sake. The enormous letter M from a shop front, which is also up there, and the framed signed photograph from Nigel from EastEnders, which mysteriously never got unpacked when we moved houses. Kisses, Emma Bromley. Um, and she says, by the way, the beaver cost £1,000. Wow. You have got to be steamed out of your mind to pay £1,000 pounds for a big stuffed beaver, surely. And they've got a little fez on there as well, a nice little hat on the beaver. But as I say, you can check out a photograph of the beaver in its full glory on our. Twitter. I can see what I can see what's being said there. You don't want a you don't want a stuffed creature with very sharp claws at toddler eye height. No, do you really? Absolutely. I mean, not. that's asking for trouble. Sure it is. But at the same time, it is wearing a fez. Yeah. So I can see the quandary. It's a fun. It's a little fun fella with a. It's fez. a fun fella. Oh, Bit of dangerous, edgy fun around the house. <laughs> <laughs> Get you on right. your toes. Anyway, thanks a lot for all your messages there. Uh, we might unpack a new uh, Textonation basket later on in the programme. But for now, is this your free play, Joseph Cornish? What is it? Bit of Fine Young yeah, Cannibals. Yeah, this is the Fine Young Cannibals. This is called Good Thing. Uh, pushing out into new sonic territory there. That's the white stripes. Uh, icky thump. <laughs> so, 
Okay. <laughs> Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Hey. Hey. How you doing, listeners? Here's a message from David Doll. We had a couple of messages on this subject. Also got a message from uh, Chris. Thanks for that, Chris. But I'm going to read out David's message. Dear Buckwheat and Corn You Copy Balls. I was recently sitting down, catching up on my podcasts, and started listening to the Desert Island Discs, your Desert Island Discs special. It went out on Saturday, the 11th of June, last weekend. Uh, it was a very enjoyable and only slightly tedious rundown of <laughs> listeners' favourite discs for nearly two hours. Special studio guests were Miranda Sawyer, Paul Gambaccinoid, he says, and Howard Goodall. During the opening preamble, Howard and Gambo talk about their Beatles choices. Listen carefully, or not so carefully, uh, to this clip where Gambo seems to vent his opinion of Howard's Beatles choice with a clearly audible airborne toxic event. It must be Gambo, he says, as it comes from the left speaker where Gambo is positioned. <laughs> in case you hadn't... <laughs> in case you can't find said podcast, I've, I've sent you a clip. Dirty Gambo, he says. Uh, thanks very much, David Doll. Now, I immediately heard this clip. It is a very audible mm. airborne toxic event. And I, the first thing I did was um, go and verify it, listen to the podcast and make sure that it was actually the show that was broadcast and not just a, a noise that he'd stuck in for his own amusement. Have a listen to this clip. Mm. Because John Peel had said that he knew he'd met the right woman when she said her favorite track off Revolver was And Your Bird Can Sing. And I thought, a lovely thought, and it cheers me up. But now I would just say, hey, Jude. <laughs> After all that, uh, Howard, you chose a Beatles track. You chose uh, We Can Work It Out. So yes, I, yeah. I, I chose that because um, it was, it's one of the tracks that uh, Lennon and McCartney truly wrote together, um, which is quite rare, in fact, in, in the Beatles catalogue. And because the idea of working it out seemed very British. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that's quite a loud, very loud isn't toxic it? event, isn't it? And I've done nothing to that clip. I haven't, like, beefed up the sound of that or anything. That is how it was broadcast. At 100%. Creaky chair? Creaky chair. Have a little listen, because we, we, we got in touch with the... Um, we got in touch with Miranda Sawyer, who was on the show, mm -hmm. and uh, she doesn't remember it happening. So, she, you know, people in the studio weren't aware of it at the time. Um, Sarah Taylor, who is the Desert Island Discs producer says, I am 100% convinced the sound, rather than being from a bottom, is in fact a mouth snort from Paul Gambaccini. Gambaccini mouth snort. Gambaccini mouth snort. So that's what Sarah is going for. Let's listen again. Let's have another little listen. It's one of the tracks that uh, Lennon and McCartney truly wrote together, oh. um, which is quite rare. That's not a mouth That's snort. That's not a mouth snort. That is no way a mouth snort. Now, I was listening to the Can't panning, though, and... Uh, this is like the Patterson footage of Bigfoot. You've got to, got to, got to try and replicate it. Or the Zapruder footage, isn't know? it? You've I'm, got to... I'm thinking the only possible explanation is maybe a fifth farter. Uh, <laughs> you know? <laughs> on the grass. <laughs> on the grass, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's very loud, it, w which is... You know, I kind of think that's a bit anomalous. Why is it so loud if it's, as you know, further away from the mic as the posterior is? This is exactly what the mm. Desert Island Discs mm. team was saying. You know, they were saying, well, it's not going to be a uh, nether, nether regions toxic event because there's no mics down there. So how are you going to get that? I don't mic, know. Could be a mic stand? No, no, no. What, one more listen, James. That is not a mic stand. That is no way a mic stand. That it's one of the bottom. tracks that uh, Lennon and McCartney truly wrote together, uh. um, which is quite rare. <laughs> I mean, wow, uh, that's terrible, though, because Could it be? it, it might that be. was a big show. It was the big <laughs> anniversary show, wasn't it? And it's an important show. How could that be? Yeah. I mean, that, do you think, if, that Gambaccini? <laughs> Wow, I think we should give that footage to Monster, que Monster Fart Quest or um, Unexplained Fart Stories. I think Oliver Stone is making a uh, film about it. Is he? Yeah, trying to figure out who it was. <laughs> <laughs> His theory is that it's a fifth farter, but really? um, a lot of people think it's Gambo. Yeah. I just don't think Gambo's too professional for that kind of thing. I mean, there is a chance that it was just some creepy... Should I tell you what it is? I think they, they were all laughing a bit earlier, weren't they? Yeah. And that, they became relaxed. <laughs> yeah. Everyone happens. was a bit too relaxed sure. and, you know, yeah, just the inevitable happened. Toxic event time. For... Uh, okay, here's a bit, some uh, music. Uh, is it a bit... Yeah? Yeah, good. What is it? 
It's delight. I'm, I, I just want to go back and erase that little introduction I just did there. Here's a bit. It's a bit. And now I'm making it worse by talking about it. <laughs> this is Groovers in the Heart. Boo, 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 boo. Somewhere I've got a video of us dancing around like buffoons to that myself, Joe, and Louis, a young Louis Theroux when we were age 20, something like that. Something like that. It's a long time ago, 1990 or something. I would put it on YouTube, but I think it would it might run into problems with the music, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm just a little distracted because we're getting lots of texts about um, the airborne toxic event. Sure. What, what kind of theories are circulating there? Uh, Stephen Chicken says it's definitely a mouth noise. No. You need to get a bit of nasal flemminess onto it too, though. I'm also sure it's on the inhale, not the exhale. Therefore, I believe he's clearing his nose by sucking the smog down the back of his throat. Hmm. No. It's nothing like that. Can we have a quick listen? It's one of the tracks that uh, Lennon and McCartney truly wrote together, um, which is quite rare. Mm, it would, that would have to be a full-on raspberry, which would be a very immature thing to do during such a stately and important programme. Yeah. I think we need... If you're a sound scientist... I know we have many uh, sonic scientists listening to this show. Sure. Do a, do a kind of Oliver Stone uh, stroke John Travolta in um, Blowout, suggests Gary. Uh, do, do an analysis of it and see if you can figure out what it is. Slow it down, examine the waveform, we were thinking, compare it to other famous toxic events mm -hmm. from history. Sure. Uh, we were thinking possibly if they have leather seats in the studio and one of the guests, maybe Goodall's got his leather trousers on or his leather yeah. pants. Yeah, well, we were picturing Gambo maybe in a kind of uh, a, a, le a faux leather flight jacket. Yeah. But we can find it. Well, we're going to find out what the seats are made of in that studio. This is a very important thing that's happening here you know somebody it's an important pro it's, it's, it's like, a very important program and Island it's Disc, that's more or less the flagship the anniversary show of the it's the founding stone of the bbc and someone has ridiculed it and compromised it therefore they must be brought to justice and we are relying on you our listenership to to help us get to the bottom of it yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> okay um so listen folks i think it's time we had some egg corns don't you because people continue to send these in to the extent that i have created a new jingle that's always a fun what? thing isn't it because it officially becomes a segment even though this is our last studio bound show for this current run of the program we're going to be in glastonbury next weekend of course i thought it would be nice to get this in here to make it an official egg corn compartment so here we go with the new jingle Somebody's been ear dropping on me And now I'm suffering their strings and arrows Can't you see? I was standing on the curve Like a jester of goodwill But now I'm curled up in the feeble position Still cause of my Erdcorns When it comes to egg corn business Erdcorns I'm like Farmer Heck in Christmas Erdcorns The pop will call the kettle back Erdcorns Cause it's an egg corn attack Attack Got some egg corns incorporated in the lyrics. Very there. good. And you remember we were talking about scary guttural voices last week, mm. and I was sort of speculating as to where that started. We got a message from Ollie and Jessamine, aka Ogs and Pod. Hi, Joe Ninety and Buxton. Uh, a good friend of mine and brilliant musician, Justin K. Broderick, original founder of Napalm Death and now Jesu slash Godflesh, was one of the first people to sing in that scary, demonic, crazed voice. It's widely considered that he actually invented it. I'm sure that's a controversial point of view and we'll get loads of messages going, No, actually, it was Gary Grunty. They won't be in that face. voice, though. Might be. Anyway, he says... Hope They're being this voice. <laughs> <laughs> I think you'll find I invented that voice. Thanks very much, Ollie and Jessamine. So, yeah, Eggcorns. We got a few of these through this week. Here's one to kick things off from Paolo in London's Cruel Centre. He says, Fella boys, uh, whilst working at the Royal Festival Hall at the turn of the millennium, I had a bar manager who used an incredible array of language, a kind of grab bag of phrases that he never quite mastered nor understood. One day he asked me where I'd left the tubs of ice cream that we used to sell at the intervals. I said they were on the top level, in the fridge. He went all the way to the top floor to retrieve them. Only then did I realise I had the key to the fridge. He returned after about five minutes. So vast is that huge building, it takes ages to get around. And he was absolutely fuming. He shouted, You deliberately sent me on a wild goof trek! <laughs> <laughs> i now use that term exclusively in place of the original it's so much better uh the same manager also, also used to shout flaming laura whenever he was upset <laughs> you've sent me on a wild goof trek 
Flaming Laura. Oh, Flaming Laura. He's brilliant. Here's one from a chap called Nick Cheese. I don't think his surname is Cheese. I think he just works in some sort of cheese-related business. Uh, a friend of mine recently said, when walking into our messy office, Oh, looks like a bombsy tit. <laughs> what? Looks like a bombsy tit. <laughs> to which we all fell about laughing. He said that was what his mum always used to say about his bedroom. And then we got another email, <laughs> slightly later, from Sean Buckley, which says, Darling... Yeah, I'm not going to read that. It calls us quite rude names. It says, Throughout my childhood, my mum used to tell me that my room looked like... A bummer's it it. Then, when I was about 12, she said, Your room looks like a bomb has hit it. And that was that. So maybe that's the same guy. So they, he thought that there was an actual thing called a bomber zit it. Bomber zit it, yes. And then the other one is bombsy tit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know quite what's going on there, listeners. I'll leave you to figure that out. Your room looks like a bomber zit it. <laughs> it no, it's not. It's a bombsy tit. Um, I don't know why I read that in an Australian accent as well. A bombsy tit sounds like something they might have. I don't know. A crashed, an yeah. old crashed aeroplane. Oh, mate, look at your bombsy tit. That's nice. <laughs> is that a new one? Uh, here's a message from Jez, Jeremy, that is, a male man from black squadron in bristol and he says dear old dirty buckle and jake horn mm -hmm. whilst out walking with my girlfriend tess the other day we passed a man at which point i said oh i think that was terry nutkins at which point she asked me the one from the beatrix potter books um <laughs> real uh, at realizing what she'd said she then laughed for 10 minutes and then when she could catch her breath she said <laughs> i mean lord of the rings <laughs> Love you, bye. <laughs> what? <laughs> Terry Nutkins from... So he says, I think that was Terry Nutkins. And she goes, what, the one from the Beatrix Potter books? And then she, <laughs> and she goes, oh, no. <laughs> I mean Lord of the Rings. Yes. <laughs> Um, what's he called, Nutkins? There is a Nutkins character in, um, he's not called Squirrel Terry, Nutkins. is he? Squirrel Nutkins. Yeah. Yeah. Is, so he, it's an understandable is, is Squirrel mistake. Nutkins in Lord of the Rings? Nah. nah. You it, sure? He might be in one of those crowd scenes at the back. He might be. Terry Nutkins <laughs> might be in the back there, as far as I know. <laughs> um, I've got a whole, like, list of quickfire ones oh. here. This is a nice little list that's been sent in by Matt. He's a bloke man. Mm. And Matt says, uh, Matt says, A&J, over the years I've documented the spoonerisms, malapropisms and faux pas of a chap in my office. Here is a very brief selection. You've completely missed the wrong end of the stick. <laughs> if push comes to crunch, I couldn't see the trees for looking. Uh, you need to make a stance. Don't jump your horses. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. That one could be good. Yeah. That could actually go into circulation. Uh, it's time to put the foot to the metal. Mm -hmm. Let's get the ball moving. <laughs> <laughs> and we can't argue pedantics all day. Ooh. <laughs> 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 Why not? I love arguing pedantics. Oh, we can't argue pedantics all day, so don't jump your horses and get your foot to the metal. <laughs> Thanks very much there. That's Matt. Uh, have you got any more there, Jay Corn? Uh, yeah, I do. Um, yeah, I do. Do you want to hear them? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Uh, I heard a cracking egg corn the other day whilst talking to my girlfriend. We were discussing the difficulties in getting a job when she said... I know, it's doggy dog out there. <laughs> As opposed to dog eat dog. I thought this was hilarious and never planned to ever, ever, ever let her forget it. Although Lots of love, Sam, a female, ma a female man. Female man. From Brighton. Mm, nice. Mm. My favourite kind of man. Um, that is why Snoop called his album Doggy Dog World, though, isn't it? Maybe. That was that pun. Uh, finally, from me, Ilse. Hey, Ilse. He's a regular uh, communicator with the show. He's a he chap says um, he just communicates a little conversation that took place with uh, his mate and his mate's girlfriend. Which do you prefer, red wine or white wine? Well, that's a real bowl of contention. Now, that's weird, because we just had a text in that said exactly the same one. I wonder if it's the same person. That's got to be a common one, though, isn't Pete it? Pete, says Pete. A guy I work with regularly uses the phrase, a bowl of contention, that instead of bone. Yeah. Says Pete. That is a real bowl that's of contention. That's a common one, mate. Oh, mate, you've got a massive bowl of contention. Can I have some of that? No, it's mine! Uh, OK, here's a bit of music right now. So there you go, that's Egg Corns for this week, all right? You can contribute to Egg Corns too. The text number is 64046, but it's best done via email, adamandjoe.6music at bbc.co.uk. Here's Sleigh Bells. This is real, real. 
Uh, there you go. They're from Brooklyn in New York City. That's Sleigh Bells with Real Real out next week, 27th of June. Their debut album, Treats, is out now. Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. I've got a free play coming up, and I was listening uh, a while back to one of Mark Riley's excellent shows, and I know that he is quite a massive Deep Purple fan. Do you ever get into the perps, Joe? No, I've never really got into the Perps. I mean, the Perps are one of those kind of big clownish heavy metal bands. Well, they're legendary, obviously. And um, the thing is that much Spinal Tap folklore is based on, or rather, mu- much Spinal Tap is based on kind of Deep Purple folklore. The whole Stonehenge thing mm. is, a, is a Perps thing. And I've had um, Deep Purple's greatest hits in my CD collection for years and years and years and years. I got it because of the track Burn, which I absolutely love. My friend Tom Hardiman got me into that. Thanks, Tom! But um, here's another track that I discovered via one of Mark Riley's shows. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. Check out the organ solo in this. I think it's from 1972 from their album Fireball. This is Deep Purple. From 1972. That's amazing. Deep Purple with Fireball. Check out that organ solo. Some particularly there. powerful tambourine going on there yeah, as well. That's great. I owe, owe that uh, to Mark Riley, yeah, for turning me on to that. He's back on air from 7 on Monday here on BBC Six Music. This is Adam and Joe, though. Uh, it's 11.30, just gone 11.30, and it's time for the news. That's the Gorillas with On Melancholy Hill. Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. Hey, how are you doing? Now, the other day, I was out in the uh, Jardin, uh, Max Factor. Oh, yeah. And um, there's a lot of, uh, you know, nettles. Mm, they're that, a problem in the countryside, in the English countryside. Man. They're very prolific. They are prolific as all heckins. And it only takes a couple of weeks for them to decide that it's time for them to go all prolific on your ass. Mm. You know, literally... One week, there'll be nothing there, and the winter will be finally put to bed, and the spring comes around, and then suddenly it gets a tiny bit warmer. Nettles! Everywhere. Yes. They're the scourge, aren't they? They're, they're there to teach children that nature is dangerous. What the heck is the point of the nettle? That, well, just what I said. To teach children that nature is dangerous. Yeah, they're sort of harmless. That's what you're saying, is it? Yeah, they're kind of... It's like the, um, it's like the thin end of the lethal nature wedge. Right, okay, okay. You know Herzl could do a documentary on nettles. 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 The evil, the most evil. They want to kill you. They revel in murder. Uh, I was trying to clear away... And I got obsessed with the idea of combating murder. (laughs) (laughs) I I got obsessed with the idea of combating the nettle scourge, right? Because right, trying to clean them out. Yeah, there there was one area that's totally. We had it as a nice little bonfire area, Mm -hmm. and we had some big logs that were out there, like half logs. And we were sat out there just a few weeks ago. Me and my brother and my dad were sat out there like mountain men. The nettles hated you doing that. Sharing tall tales. They were lurking in the weeds, watching you. Yeah, (laughs) whispering. As soon as you went indoors, they started growing yeah. up. Now they're like waist height now. I mean, they're mm-hmm. absolutely sure. huge. They're furious with the you. The thing about the nettles is that if you have the protective clothing yes. and the correct gloves, you can uproot them very satisfyingly easily. Like you pop them mm-hmm. out, mm-hmm. and all their roots come out, and you're like, yeah. They have poisonous hairs. They do. Have they're like a man hairs. with a. They're like a ha- a, a hirsute man with poisonous hairs. Don't you mean her stute? Oh, damn it. <laughs> I got it so wrong, I got it right. <laughs> um, they are her suit. They're deadly, her suit. Um, how do they work? Let's see. They have uh, hollow stinging hairs called, Correct. called trichomes. Trichomes, that's right. On their leaves and stems, which act like hypodermic needles. Mm-hmm. Oh, steady in- on, steady on, steady that on. That inject histamine and other chemicals no, 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 that no, produce no, no, a stinging no. sensation. They act like hypodermic yes. needles. They, they, they're suggesting they penetrate the skin. Correct. I thought they just brushed against it. No, penetrate skin. Do they? Like hypodermic needle. <laughs> really? Yes, they go into your skin. OMG. And that is why, uh, you know, and here's some top tips for what to do. I went and searched for how to avoid being stung by a nettle or dealing with nettle stings. Well done. First top tip on WikiHow was move away from the nettles. Yes. To a nearby area to prevent being <laughs> stung again. <laughs> What's that? Don't go so close to the oh, nettle. My technique is usually to press my face into the nettle. Well, that's why I've been going yeah. wrong. Yeah, exactly. I've been wandering around with my shorts on. Don't do that. 
go to somewhere where there are no nettles. Good Top tip. tip. Good tip. Uh, a more practical tip. Pour a small amount of water on the ground, only enough to create mud, and apply the mud to the scorn. I thought you were going to say scorn. Pour a small amount of scorn on the nettles. I don't think scorn works on nettles. Really? It's one of the only things that scorn doesn't what? actually have any <laughs> What was the piece on. of advice then? Pour some... Pour some water on the ground to create some mud, and then apply mud to the sting. Wait for it to dry, then brush it off. Hopefully, what about this? What about this? It will remove the stingers with it. This see. seems very uh, long-winded. Hmm. I thought, isn't there a thing where if you just grab a nettle with confidence... Yes. ...and gusto, it won't sting you? You, like, right. you psych the nettle out. Yeah, well, presumably, if we are thinking of it in terms of these little hypodermic needles, presumably you're sort of deflecting them, you're not allowing them to penetrate your if skin. If you meet them with, with equal and greater force... Yes. ...you you're, bend the needle. You're just sort of bashing the needle, right. right. Final top tip, apply adhesive tape to the infected area, then remove. Most of oh. the stinging hairs will be pulled out of the skin. It's all about removing oh, so the, these stingers. The, the nettles, st s they stay in your they skin. They stay in the skin. Who, who knew? Who knew? Who knew? Who, knew? who, who the heck knew? I about about, about the, hey, what wasn't I told about the stingers in the, in the, in the skin right now? So the other day I was combating the net owls and I had a lot of protective gear on, but I got mm -hmm. so obsessed with winning that I started, I, I started getting stung quite badly, more and more and more. And then I was just, I don't care, I'm going to kill you hecking nettles. And I went in there and in the end I came out and my arms were just ballooned, red, covered in, in horrible sort of pockmarked stings. Were your arms bare? Were they nude? A little bit, yeah. Oh, that That's was a I mistake, wrong. mate. Put, I put gobbles But what on. about dock leaves? We should mention dock leaves sure. as well. The, the, because the, nature slaps and strokes. Exactly. Uh, it slaps you with the stingers and then it strokes you with the dock leaves. And they always grow nearby. It's so weird. It's that, very balanced. Isn't it? What's nature thinking? What is nature thinking? Just to give you a little smack and then, yeah, oh, there's a dock leaf there, stop complaining. I've done a little song about nettles. Have you? Yeah, in the style of my, well, I've done it. You're not going to play it, are you? Yeah, it's so You've short. You've brought it in. It's short. Um, yeah, I do this thing, cun Country Man, and, uh, which is on, uh, I've given it a plug before on the show. I hope you don't mind if I do again. It's on the BBC's comedy website and sometimes my YouTube channel. Subscribe, why not? <laughs> it's all right, it's not a money-making venture. I'm not violating any rules. This is my song about nettles. Nettles, nettles, painful part, so close to my heart. Nettles, like all a band of puppies, the sting is an integral part. Nettles, also like a band of puppies, Stuart Copeland is their dramas. Nettles, also like a band of puppies, their blooming news in Andy Summers. Nettles, also like a band for police, they recently reformed and went to touring. Nettles, but unlike a band for police, nobody will pay to see the nettles. I didn't say it was good. <laughs> it was good. <laughs> it was very good. I just said it was about nettles. Wow. <laughs> right. Um, so can we can we kind of weave some kind of text the nation oh. into this, like a, a battles with nature somehow? You know, nature nightmares. Nature nightmares. Uh, we'll have to have a little think about that. War with nature. How can we that? can we have a record and, nature and war. think about it? Nature war. You're not letting us have a record. Nature war. Nature, nature war. Nature war. <laughs> this is Arcade Fire. <laughs> We're speaking in tongues. Good stuff. Well done, Arcade Fire. With speaking in tongues. So I think we're going to fire off the Text the Nation jingle and just very briefly set out our stall. Why the heck not? Here it is. Text the Nation. Text, text, text. Text the Nation. What if I don't want to? Text the Nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. So you boiled it down there to what there? Nature Buckley's war. Nature war. So times when you go for a wonderful walk or a ramble or a frolic in nature, mm -hmm. in God's garden, with a big smile on your face, you go gambling and skipping into some natural area and then something uh, rears its ugly head Na to tell you to get out. Nature pops up and slaps you right in the yeah. face off. Not um, looking for nasty things. Wow. Like, for, yes, we are. Yeah, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> so what else, like... Um, well, the, I mean, it doesn't have to be you've gone out rambling. It's just any kind of uh, skir skirmish, skirfle that you've had with nature, with nature. you know? Because do you ever listen to Gardener's Question Time? 
sometimes a little bit oh, you know only when things go wrong that's how i listen to it <laughs> uh sometimes you're trapped with it i mean I, I, obviously i know it's a great show it's a great show no disrespect but we're not mutually interested in gardening no. that much and i listen to it long enough to realize what it is it's not my preferred show i'm not so mad keen a gardener that i really absolutely have to listen to it so when it comes on and there's absolutely nothing else on and it's but it's a fantastic show and we wouldn't want to undermine its legacy never want to undermine the legacy of the gardener's question time <laughs> <laughs> but oh boy it goes on and on and on and they my favorite part of it though when I, when I start perking up and thinking hey this is a bit more fun is when people have questions about unruly plants and when the roots go crazy and go underneath people's fences and stuff and how do i when nature this? fights back you know when nature goes absolutely nuts on your ass yeah uh that's good the, subject nature war think, yeah nature war get those uh, messages coming in you know yeah, any any kind of battles you've had with nature, all right? Text is 64046. <laughs> Email is adamandjoe.6music. We're not talking about animals. Though, UK. though, are we? What? We're not talking about animals, though. A plant. We're talking about the natural kingdom. Plants and insects. Are we talking about insects? Uh, You're talking about plants. We're talking about mainly plants. Because animals and insects come under the subheading of nature. They do, don't they? They do. They do, do, do. So are you talking about plant war? Mainly. Specifically, like Triffid encounters. Am I? What do you think? Well, what's the plant from Little Shop of Horrors called? Oh. It's a lady's name. Daphne or something. Oh, no, that kind of thing. Me on the spot. <laughs> that kind of thing? What, the plant from Little Shop of Horrors? Yeah. <laughs> you battled with fi- have you thing? battled with fictional deadly plants? <laughs> Is that explanation? Yes, no, I, that would be good for me. I'd like that. <laughs> Nature War! Interpret it uh, uh, how you wish. There right you now, go. You've got now, a free play. I saw a couple of uh, sneaky peek films this week. Did you? I saw a terrifying film called Kill List. Kill List? What's directed that? by Ben Wheatley. Oh, yeah. It, just, it's, it was terrifying. Was it? And very violent, mm. but very brilliant. Yeah. It was a sneaky peek. I recommend it. Good old Wheatley. Very scary. I also saw a film directed by Dexter Fletcher, right. who I met this week. Yeah. That was quite exciting to meet Dexter Fletcher. Sure, from Preston. Oh, quite exciting. Very exciting. Yeah. I've followed his career since Bugsy Maloon. Absolutely. Uh, I was in a uh, film with him. Were you? Yeah. Well, he was Stardust. Of course. And he's directed a film called Wild Bill. It's very good. It stars Charlie Creed Miles. It's a sort of a sort of an urban western. Yeah. It was ruddy good and it had some great music on it, including this track that I haven't heard for yonks. This is uh, Aaron Neville with Hercules. Wow. That sounds like a 90s record. Is that a new record or an old record? That's from their 1999 album there Vertigo. You go. So it's the end of the 90s. That track was featured in which amazing films, Joe Cornish? Oh, amazing yeah, two films. The, two of the best films ever made. Two of the best <laughs> films ever made. Weekend at Bernie's, Weekend at Bernie's 2. Oh, very close. Very close, mate. Very close, mate. What? Uh, it's a Sandra Bullock's film. Oh, The, the Net. I mean, that is oh, the most amazing so film ever made. amazing <laughs> films to choose from when you get to Bullock. Okay, Miss Congeniality is yes, one and two. Yes, Bongo! Yeah. Uh, that t- track popped up in Miss Congeniality. The film's so good, they made it again and then turned it into a stage show as well, didn't they? Hooray! Hooray! That would, be a, that would be a good text the nation, like big West End versions of uh, yeah. uh, stupid uh, films, because that's all the rage, isn't it? There's a Shrek one. Sure there there's is. a private function one. That's supposed to be very good, the private function one. Richard Blackwood is in, is in Shrek. That's playing right. the Eddie Murphy part. Good for him. He's finally achieved. What What's going, going on? There's What's noises. There, James? We are entering the oh. We have successfully passed through the noon barrier. Ooh. Wow, that ever happens. since we challenged James to put the noon <laughs> barrier in the very centre of the podcast last week, I forgot which what it he was. did, <laughs> amazingly, yeah. he's taking his uh, responsibility very seriously. Sure he is. I couldn't work out what was happening. I was like, James has lost his mind. Um, but yes, the other, the other film, of course, was, uh, I say of course, Gone in 60 Seconds. Of course. I mean, that's a, that is a film, isn't it? That's a film. It's yeah, an actual that's a film. remake. <laughs> it's a film. Yeah. So listen, I went to see a uh, a magic show this week. Did you? I went to see uh, to see. I went to see Darren Brown's Sven Gali. Yes, I saw that a few months back in Norwich. You did, didn't you? Yeah, I loved it. And then you had the man himself round to your house for tea, isn't that right? How do you know that? Because someone told me. You told me. Did I? That's exciting. I'm jealous. Yeah. Uh, but I went to see his show, and the problem with going to see the Darren Brown show, Svengali, mm. is one cannot say anything about it. No, Darren is very explicit and asks politely at the beginning of the show for people not to talk about it afterwards. One is sworn to secrecy, and uh, and I, I'm going to respect that, swearings. So, not so good for a radio chat. Not so good for radio <laughs> chat, but I was there with um, uh, television documentarian Louis Theroux. 
and he enjoyed it was that the name drop voice yeah and he enjoyed it very much and we we were chatting afterwards but i noticed something that he that louis he he wouldn't let go he just wanted to know how everything was done he had to know how it was all done and he looked he had that look on his face when confronted by a particularly intransigent racist for instance (laughs) (laughs) like what i have to get to the what is your problem i have to get to the bottom of this he would not let it go yeah and so we spent a long time trying to dissect how the tricks were done but you know, I used to be a very bad magician as a teenager. I used to make money by doing magic at children's parties. Mr. Magico was amazing, let me tell you, listeners. He was amazing. I've I, seen I'm him in myself down. But there's no way, you know, I don't know how Darren does a lot of it. But I've reached a point where, having read a bit about magic, I know that that's, you know, that's not the most rewarding path to follow. No, because the truth is always far more banal than... Well, plus the truth is it's magic. You know, and he has psych- creepy psychic powers. That is true, isn't it? And so you don't want to mess with it. You don't want to go too close to it because it's dangerous. You should just in- assume that it's magic and enjoy the effect. Like, this guy is psychic. He can read minds. He does understand. He can guess the numbers and things and what one is the what one with the bullet in it and stuff. Yeah. He can do all that. So w- the thing to enjoy is the effect that he produces with that skill. Yes. And how he dramatizes it and well, stages it. It's a compulsion, a feeling that I think a lot of people have when they come out of that mm. show. I just need to know how that was done. Otherwise, it's going to blow my but mind. But you can pretty much divide people down the middle with people who will just enjoy the moment and people who have to know. Well, I, I, I even experienced that as a... A young um uh, rubbish magician yeah as mr magico you used to get kids at parties who were just who did not enjoy the spectacle it made them angry yeah it sort of confronted them they just couldn't handle the fact that they weren't being told the secret i talked about this before on the radio but the same thing happened with us do you not remember that hot uh, hot night when we were revising <laughs> for our history o levels oh you couldn't let go and i couldn't let go because you did a thing with um spongy red balls I and did. i was like yeah that was good mr magico how did you do it He's like, I'm not going to tell you. So like, come on, just tell me. No, I'm not going to tell you. Like, seriously, tell me how you did it with a spongy ball. No, I'm not going to tell so you. So how would you distinguish those people? Is it like, Furious. it's like concrete thinking versus plastic thinking? Well, I, Does that exist? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you are a concrete one. I'm a concrete one. Maybe, yeah, a literal minded person. Perhaps I'm very literal minded. I can't speak for Louis, but. I, I was able to ride out my, um, you know, uh, determination to find out how it was all done. You know, because Darren was saying uh, some people go online and they collude with each other to kind of establish... Silly business, silly business. It's magic and uh, and you should just enjoy it. Yeah. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a fantastic show. It is. It was wicked. It is literally wicked. He's got a devil's tail on the poster. It's involved with the devil on the pasta. It's scary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's great. That's uh, the end of that, though. Do check it out if you get the chance to. It's it's very good. Here's the Rolling Stones. Have you seen your mother baby standing in the shadows? I have. Yeah. Travelling tales, travelling tales, tales of travelling on the train, or an automobile, or an aeroplane. I want to know what you're travelling tales. All aboard the Skylark! If Coldplay don't play that at Glastonbury, I'm going to be very, very angry. What, your jingle? Yeah. (laughs) Right, okay. Come on, Chris Martin, because that is a classic song. Absolutely. Well, why would they do that and not the Retro Text the Nation jingle? (laughs) What sort of a noise is that? Uh, Dismissive. (laughs) It's a very stupid noise. It's a very stupid, stupid, disrespectful (laughs) noise. Next, you'll be farting during the Desert Island Discs special. I wouldn't be that disrespectful. How dare you insult the legacy? How dare you? Here is a message from Peter from Bournemouth. Actually, no, sorry. Um, it is Stephen Paul Shepherdson. I'll get to you later, Peter. Um, he says, Dear Bucks Adaman- Adamton and Cor Jonish. What do you think about this thing about that's the, happened? the name mangling? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's good. It's good. It's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's oh, good, isn't it? I'm I mean, happy with it. Never the same one twice. Never the same one twice. Uh, lots of cornucopias. Um, but anyway, Bucks Adamanton and Joe Cordonish. He's done a bit of spoonerizing. I was recently on an aeroplane with my lovely wife, reluctantly returning home from a wonderful holiday. I'd been given an aisle seat, which was fine by me. I thought I could still glance across out of the window and watch the clouds float by. However, every time I turned my head, the man next to me was leaning over with his nose pressed against the little window, totally obscuring it. All I could see was the large lump of brill cream congealed on the back portion of his hair. At the time, this infuriated me as the little joy a flight has to offer was totally lost 
Now, was he being selfish, or does the owner of the window seat automatically have full window rights? What are your valued opinions? So, Stephen Paul. Stephen Shepherd. is saying that this person, the the passenger next to him, blocked the window for the whole journey. Yeah, the window seat, and his face was mashed right up against it, staring down at the clouds there. Really? Uh, so, what do you do about that? Is that on? Are you within your rights to say, "Excuse me, could I have a little bit of window time"? I mean, I know I'm on the aisle, but still, it depends if the captain announces that there's an extraordinary view which sometimes they do, ladies yeah. and gentlemen you might like to know that we're flying over the grand canyon a spectacular view of the grand canyon outside the right hand windows of the plane immediately everybody jumps up the plane tips yeah. to the right because all the weight's gone over to the right Go right into the grand that canyon. happened when i was on the plane the other week did it yeah and uh, i was very good i sat back i had a little look then i sat back in my seat and let everyone else peer yeah that's nice you've got to share the view sure but i think maybe that man was having psychological problems if he spent the entire flight staring at clouds <laughs> <laughs> and i think that uh, who is it steve steve should and... be a little more uh, empathic towards this person's mental state because steve is on the aisle mm. am i right yeah. so he has access to the lavvy that's he has right. first dibs on the fun trolley it shouldn't ruin your entire flight it shouldn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, shouldn't, shouldn't i mean maybe the guy as well was staring at some kind of gremlin ripping out um, you know, engines exactly on the wing. Yeah, that could have been toilet own style. So yeah, I think if you haven't got the window seat, tough, tough luck, Buster. <laughs> tough luck, Buster. All right, decision made. It's gone against the correspondent for once. Yeah, sorry about that. Tough love. Here's a message we got from. Oh, this is this is very long, but it's quite good. Rob Ryan, dear Adam and Joe, for my birthday, my wife Lorna bought me a pair of these really expensive. Uh, noise-reducing headphones. I was making a journey from London to Leeds in first class, thinking to myself I'd have a nice time doing my doing stuff on my laptop, listening to some music with my cool new headphones. Doesn't get better than that. So far, so good. I was really enjoying the coffee and biscuits when I felt that I might possibly need to fart. Now, I have to explain to listeners that this is a quite a fart-based piece of correspondence, so if you find that unsettling or unclean, you might like to look away. There will be quite detailed mention of farting coming up. To continue the letter... Airborne toxic event is the proper technical term. I'll use that. At this point, I should explain that I'm 48 years old, and since hitting 40, my need to unleash airborne toxic events has reached endemic proportions. I have no idea that my middle-aged years would be so gassy. Basically, I fart all day long. Anyway, the seat was nice and soft for good sound absorption, so I thought I might just ease a little silent one out and get away with it. Success! Twenty minutes later, the need came again. Could I risk it twice? I did. I succeeded. The journey continued pretty much in this vein, farting silently every ten minutes, until about five minutes from reaching my destination, I started packing my stuff away, took off my headphones. Just before we reached the station, I felt the need to do it again. No problem, I thought. These luxuriously soft first-class leather seats are perfectly designed to muffle any rear-end noises. And adopting the same technique again, I very gently released a, a toxic event the rasping noise that issued was deafening <laughs> i'd forgotten i was wearing my noise excluding headphones i'd been letting off explosive guffs all the way from london to yorkshire whilst merrily grooving and nodding along to my music <laughs> classy my fellow passengers looked up at me with a contempt reserved only for the type of imposter who thinks that he can travel first class and fart continuously throughout a two-hour journey what a monster yours rob ryan Rob, sort your Woo! life out. We've all been there. Have we? Yeah. I mean, I haven't. But you've been there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I may have been there on a plane. Yeah. But I, fingers crossed, the noises on, the noise of the air system on a plane and everyone's got Absolutely. Their headphones on. Oh, you can go for but your life with chilling. impunity. That's chilling. That is chilling. A similar thing happened to me the other day uh, when I was um, riding in what I thought was an empty carriage. Mm. And um, I had a, a, a luxuriant, explosive, toxic event. Mm. And um, looked behind me when I got up to leave, and there was a lady that ran behind me. a lady being me. sick into her handbag. That ran behind me in the thing, <laughs> looking at me with a revulsion. <laughs> Thank you, Rob Ryan. Uh, he also says, P.S., my favourite part of the show is when you talk Australian. Mate. I I'm, love that, mate. I think he's the only one. I've got a special so treat for you now, for then, mate. You, because this is from Tom Lemessurier, a male man from Winchester, but living in John Rio. Lemessurier. Uh, Tom. Let's pretend it's John. Okay. Uh, isn't that cool, though? He's living in Rio. He's probably in a carnival salsa. right now. Salsa. <laughs> 
Salsa. Dear belt buckle and corn cakes, this happened a few years ago. I was on a very busy commuter train heading out of London at the end of a long day at work. There was no air conditioning and a lot of people were having to stand as the train was so overcrowded. A middle-aged guy in a suit started writing a text on his phone, but he had the ketones on. So every single key press he made was accompanied by a beep sound. We were all putting up with it in what I think is probably a very English manner, i.e. hating him but too scared to say anything. Suddenly, an Australian guy said to him, Hey, I've had a long day at work listening to phones and computers and people talking. Turn that phone off! Well, perhaps you can imagine the entire carriage went silent to see what would happen next. The guy with the phone stammered, uh, OK, OK, I'll, I'm, I'm just going to finish this message. But the Aussie guy said, no, if I hear another noise from that phone, I'm going to take it and throw it out the window. There was a stunned silence. The aggressive Aussie had scared the bejesus out of everyone. He had broken the passive-aggressive rules in a very weird way. And in a very weird way, I ended up feeling almost sorry for the texter. OK, love you, bye, says Tom LeMessurier. So the Aussie guy took control. Wow. How would you feel? Would you be pro-Aussie in that situation? I don't really know, to be perfectly honest. I mean, in a, in a danger situation where the Aussie maybe had to rescue somebody, then maybe <laughs> you would... Uh, you know that would be the right thing to do to take command like that. But I don't know. I think that's crossing a line. Is it? Isn't I mean, it? It's aggressive, isn't it? I mean, he has authority because he's Australian. Yeah. A certain cultural superiority. <laughs> he's got a scarier voice. Yes. Mate, no! If there's a simplicity and a directness to the Aussies, you don't mess with them. No, exactly. If you... Uh, I'm going to... Oh, I was just going <laughs> to... <laughs> you were going to what? I was just going to say a load of really lame, offensive stuff about kookaburras. But I'm not going to now. Good, thank God for that. <laughs> is that enough travelling tales? Let's have some music right now. This is Anna Calvi with Desire. Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Who was that then? Anna Calvi. It was good. She's statuesque. I can see the next record that's coming up. Is that a free play? Yeah, I'm mate. excited about that. I'm going to say a little bit about that. Uh, Are you going to say it now? Yeah. I'm going to play some David Bowie shortly. And the other day I was in a hardware store... And they had at the counter, sometimes hardware stores, for some reason, I don't know what it is about hardware stores, but they have uh, selections of cheap, very, very cheap DVDs over there by the checkout. And sometimes they're quite good. Um, in hardware stores? Yeah. I've noticed it. In, maybe they have them in lots of places, but something about hardware stores, they just sort of think, oh, yeah, by the way, how about a DVD? <laughs> and so they've got a really weird... What sort weird of films? Um, pretty, mostly 10th rate sort of, uh, really stuff. But in amongst the 10th rate stuff was Labyrinth. Well, that's because they stock films about tools. <laughs> nice. Um, they had an anniversary edition of Labyrinth, two disc set. I only say that because of the cod piece. Sure. Um, and there was a documentary on this Labyrinth disc. Oh, that's a great documentary. It's long. Yeah. It's sort of feature length and it's got amazing interviews with David. That's exactly right. Yes. It's called Inside the Labyrinth or Behind the Labyrinth, maybe? It's, it's called Up the Labyrinth. <laughs> up the Labyrinth. Right, Up the Labyrinth it's called. And I uh, was reminded how much I love that film. I mean, we went to see it when it came out, didn't we, in the Odeon Leicester Square? Uh, and it was yeah. 1986, and we were very excited as Bowie fans. It was 86. And Jim Henson we fans. And excited about the fact that Terry Jones had written the screenplay for Monty Python, of course. Uh, now I'm trying to get my boys to watch the thing. It's too frightening for them. It is a little bit scary. Uh, because it's too real and wonkaloid. It's all pre-CG. Well, the sort of Wizard of Ozzy stuff, but at the beginning and end, the bookend stuff is quite peculiar. Yeah. the car hers, Her home life is quite weird. And then, and then when it all kicks off, when the lightning storm starts in her bedroom, it is pretty scary. Yes. And let's remind people who haven't seen the film that this is basically about a young girl. What's the name of the actress? Jennifer Connelly. Yeah, she's very beautiful. She was in... Um, uh, Once Upon a Time in America, just before that. That's right. So this is more or less her second role, having been plucked from a life as a uh, model, I think, to play this part of a young girl who's complaining about the fact that her baby brother is making so much noise, and she says, I wish the pixies would come and take you away. Or oh, shouldn't wish that. 
And, and suddenly, just after she's wished that, there's a clap of thunder, and an owl flies into the room and transforms into Jareth, the Goblin King, played by one David Bowie. Was, was, was. And so David is standing there, resplendent in his skin tight jodhpurs, displaying for all the world his magnificent goblin pocket, and he is wearing <laughs> a timelessly ludicrous hairpiece. I mean, it's got to be the worst kind of hairstyle ever created that will never, Come ever, on. ever be fashionable, ever. It, it's good. I mean, you're about to enter a world of crazy-haired uh, Muppet puppets. Yeah, that's true. He is That haircut is your intro into that world. And it looks... Well, how would you describe it? It's kind of a Lamal fountain of It's a hair. sort of strule, Peter. <laughs> Isn't <laughs> yeah. it? It's poking at it. But it's not because that's more, I think, of Edward Scissorhands when yeah. you see strule, Peter. Mm. That's more uh, Russell Brand type... Right. Nest. But this is just ridiculous fright wig pointing up. Anyway, Bowie makes it look good, I think, as Jareth the Goblin King. But this behind the scenes thing is a treat. And Bowie is there being interviewed and um, taking it all very seriously. Here's a little clip of uh, Bowie talking about how he became involved with the project. He first brought me the concept on the 1983 tour that I did in America um, and asked me if I'd consider doing the part. And he showed me a copy of the Dark Crystal which I found a fascinating piece of work. And I could see the potentiality of making that kind of movie with humans, with songs, with a, a more of a lighter comedy script. Oh, yo, David, David, excuse me. Well, what is it? I've just come off stage. Why, why are you interrupting me? I got an idea for a movie where I got puppets and a cut piece. <laughs> that sounds very... <laughs> it sounds very interesting, are yes. you Frank Oz? Yeah, I'm just... <laughs> these are very broad impressions of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's like... Puppets and a cut piece. <laughs> well, I'm interested. Come into my uh, dressing dressing room. <laughs> Have you done anything before? I was kind of involved in the dark crystal. <laughs> That's a, a fascinating piece of work. <laughs> I can absolutely see the potentiality in what you're talking it's about. It's very man. provocative. It's su <laughs> superlatively provocative, and I'd be very interested in becoming involvesized. <laughs> <laughs> But it's a joyful documentary because you forget that it was such a hotbed of talent, that film. Apart from Bowie and Frank Oz himself, he's such a legendary figure. Uh, you've got the artist Ron Mueck. Do you mm -hmm. know that guy? He makes these giant lifelike sculptures. Well, he, he plays around with scale. He had a very famous piece called uh, Dead Dad, which was a, um, a sculpture that he made. He, his... And he was involved in Labyrinth. He was. He was one of really? the um, puppeteers. I didn't think he'd be old enough to do that. I thought he was a young chap. He, well, he was very young when he was in Labyrinth. At that stage, he was a model maker, an Australian model maker who'd been An involved. Australian model maker? Yeah, right. And then he moved to the UK, and now he's, you know, known as a fine How artist. Cool. He was in there. Uh, you've got George Lucas hanging around the set, of course, because he was exec producing that. Uh, you've got Terry Jones in there. And, and, and there's, uh, for Star Trek fans, Beverly Crusher's sister does the choreography. <sighs> <laughs> but anyway, you're going to play a good record. Yeah. I, I had this on 12 inch before the film came out. I used to play this over and over again. I mean, musically, it wasn't. I, I'm I'm going to stick my hey, neck out here. Hey, musically, hey, 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 the period wasn't oh, Bowie's strongest. Oh. Maybe, maybe what? I'm saying. Here, for example, Rubbish. is a clip of Magic Dance that he created. Dance, for the film. baby, dance. Let's this is great. You know, that's not Eno producing there. That's all I'm saying. It was just, um, those are all oh, the hip sounds oh, of the time. Oh, 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 Do oh. you miss it when people scratch things up and say, P -p power of voodoo, Yes, I do miss it. I think it should come back. Yeah. So anyway, um, the song that came out of the thing that was kind of a hit for Bowie, of course, was uh, Underground, which is what I'm going to play now. fantastic. And I do like it. I love the sort of gospel feeling of it, and uh, it reminds me of happy times. This is David Bowie with Underground. Love it. 
David Bowie, Goblin King there. What a great record. An all-time classic, as far as I'm concerned. You can see me doing a little audition for Jareth the Goblin King on YouTube, I think, somewhere, if you search for that. I did a scratch mix of that, you know, when I was about, when it came out, when I was about 15. Of Underground. Yeah, maybe I'll bring it in one day. I'll still get it on cassette. Come on, that's that awful. Adam and Joe here on BBC Six Music. It's gone 12.30. It's time for the news. I've never heard that. Stone Roses. That's unbelievable that I've never heard that, isn't it? Unbelievable. Unbelievable. What, what, they were wasting their time what if the, Bacchiles hasn't heard exactly. it. Exactly. What the world is waiting for, released uh, 1989, double A side with Fool's Gold. Yeah, because they had the same drum pattern, didn't they, on there? Good times. Drum pattern. Drum beat. Whatever you want to call it. Oh, for goodness sake. Let's just play the jingle, James. I like to change the lyrics of songs from time to time. I love the task bar. To make them refer to things I do. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh I call yeah. it appropriation, and as far as I'm aware, it isn't a crime. <laughs> I wonder if it's something you do too. I'd say that was my favourite Buckley's jingle. You know, I was trying very hard to do something a little less aggressive and you something... did very well. It's be- beautiful, very lovely singing. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a message from Julia. She's aged 30 from Liverpool. She says, Dear Count Buckler and Corn Dog, At work, when I am feeling particularly pressured to balance the many conflicting demands which are expected from a personal assistant, I like to sing, Stressed! Ah! I got an ulcer the size of the universe. What? In the in the style. I got of, a what of the size of the universe? An ulcer. Oh. In the style of Flash Gordon by uh, the Mighty Queen. I find that vocalising this doesn't help at all, but I still find myself singing it every single time. I've got a bit of scorn to pour on that. Go on then. I mean, I think it's it's very easy. I mean, Flash. You could put any single syllable word into Flash. Stress. Yeah. yeah, but the Couldn't word you? stress is in, you know, it, it fits. It's it has good, it's the good, right it's good, kind it's good, of... It's good, it's good, it's good. <laughs> I mean, people were saying the same thing about one we had the other week. The, um, mm. uh, the, the guy that sang his name to the shaving advert, Gillette. the best a man can get. Yeah. yeah. So maybe I'm, you know, maybe I, 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 it's the pot calling the kettle black. That, <laughs> calling the kettle back, don't you mean? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was my wife's favourite. Mike Shinks. The best that Fran could that's get. That's right, that's right. <laughs> um, here's one, what we got from Sinead and Hugh Kelly in London. Have you noticed how the tube announcements have started pointing out which side of the train the door will open? Which side of the train the door will open? That makes sense, yes. Yeah. This makes me and my husband start singing, the doors will open on the left-hand side. <laughs> <laughs> the other passengers do tend to look at us a bit strangely, but this always amuses us no end. <laughs> what was that noise you made? <laughs> <laughs> it was just like a sort of six-year-old to help people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just a hint what, what you're supposed to do in response to that. Cool. Thanks, cool. Sinead and Hugh Kelly. Can Cornball's laughter. <laughs> I mean, that's public appropriation. Yeah. Is that sensible, to do these things loudly in public, to sing these things? Yes, joyful. Joyful? Yeah. People might think you're a moron. No. Everyone does pop appropriation. Everybody. Everybody. Every, yeah. It's Everybody. True. Dear Jojo and Buxtable says uh, Richard and Sarah, a male man and a female woman from Brighton, our daughter has just turned two, and it's still and is still susceptible to the sorts of snots and sniffles that often loiter in toddler noses. Whenever my wife or I attempt to gently decongest said nose with a tissue, we literally cannot help but sing to the tune of Heatwave's Boogie Nights, Bogey Nose! Ain't hey, no doubt you are really snotty, Bogey Nose! Come on now, got to get it cleaned up! Dance with the boogies, get down, dance with... Because your boog bogey nose is always the best in town. You've got boogies in your boogie, boogie, stuff. bogey nose. Bogey, bogey nights there. Bogey nights. That's a good one. Though. It's we, a we, good one. We, I made up a song for my um, for Frank when he was very snotty. Mm. I, I had a, like a original thing, which was... Are you going to sing it to us? Well, bogey nose, bogey nose, bogey nose... But it was a bit, yeah, I don't really want to... <laughs> Backpedaling. He's got a great it's big too bogey personal. up it's his too, nose. It's too personal. <laughs> it's just... A, it's no one wants to hear that now. It's personal. Oh, dear. Sorry, Frank. Um. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Finally, here's one from Dermot. Which, now, this person was trying to trick me out with their name because it's spelt D-I-A-R-M-A-I-D. Diarmaid. Diarmaid. But I looked it up on the internet. Nice. And I know it's pronounced Dermot. Good job, man. I'm a man. I'm a male man in Galway, Ireland, in the 17 to 25 demographic, and I have a appropriation for you. When I walk into a room and the room is a bit chilly, I like to sing, Cold, cold in here, wah, wah, wah. Oh, like golden years. Yes. Nice. Yes. Cold, cold in here, wah, wah, wah. That's quite a good, a good one. Very good. Yeah. Um, and finally, from me, we had quite a few of these. This is one that's very popular for pop appropriation. I'm talking about the track Physical by Olivia Newton. I like John. that track. I've got it on seven. Uh, does, it, does that bear up well? Uh, I haven't listened to it for a while. It's got one of the. 20 years, perhaps. It's got a sort of sick sexist video, I seem to recall. Sick and sexist. Sick and sexist. It's just ladies working out. There's nothing sexist uh, it's about just, being I a think lady. It was Olivia and working, working out. out amongst a group oh, very fat men. Very overweight men, that's, yeah. That's weightist and sexist. Yes, yeah, you're right. Exactly. It's disgraceful. Uh, Louise, a London girl, says, I'm listening to the podcast and the item on appropriation reminded me that the other day when getting ready to cycle on a gloomy day, I'd put on lots of high-vis clothes and lights. I started singing to the tune of Physical by Olivia Newton-John, Let's get visible, visible, I want to get visible, don't want to be invisible, can you see my yellow coat, my yellow coat, can you see my yellow coat? That turns into a kind of Heidi High thing at the end there, doesn't it? It does, doesn't it? It sounds like a sort of public information film. I want film. a yellow coat. Can you see my yellow coat? Who is that? Peggy. Is that Sue Pollard? Yeah. That's good, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's it for me for pop appropriation. Have you got any more in your locker there? No. Okay. Uh, let's play some Metronomy now. We're going to be hanging out with Metronomy, I hope. I mean, they're big. They're one of these bands that, you know, they were sort of um, grooving around in the shadows earlier this year. And now... They're on the pyramid stage at Glastonbury this year. So I hope we're going to lure them into our stinky den when we're there next weekend. This is The Bay by Metronomy. Text the nation. Text, text, text. Text the nation. What if I don't want to? Text the nation. But I'm using email. Is that a problem? It doesn't matter. Text. Text the nation. This week is all about nature war. Times when you think you are going to have a lovely time in God's garden. The benevolent world of green things. You frolic into it and find it biting you on your ass mm. in a nasty manner. Here is one from Nick in Cumbria. I took my family for a nice Boxing Day walk to see some icicles that had been pictured in the local paper. Good effort, mate. The path to them turned out to be treacherous a treacherous sheet of ice. My three daughters were weeping in fear. Our pensioner friend Maggie slipped off the path onto a frozen river. She couldn't get back up until passing walkers equipped with boot spikes lashed together dog leads and hauled her out. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't look impressed by our sloppy shoes. <laughs> I got it in the neck, big style, but I told my wife, we've gained an anecdote. <laughs> Love you guys, Nick in Cumbria. <laughs> I like stuff that turns horrific. I mean, that's good, because no one was actually hurt, yeah, but it glad. started out as a lovely little frolic and turned into a Kevin MacDonald-style nightmare. I'm impressed that he got the family out to see the icicles there. That would not have gone down well. Whereas they were probably amazing. Yeah. Imagine the picture in the local paper. I guess. They would have made them look nice. Yeah, they were all icicles. nice and icy. Here's one from Rob in Croston in Lancashire. Sometimes when I'm walking or running along, I see an overhanging tree branch. I like to give it a high five. I'm high fiving nature. Is it a bit OCD perhaps, but I love to do it. <laughs> I also used to do this when riding my bike until one horrible day. On my route home from work, there was always a tempting branch which punctuated my journey home. Nowhere near the road, that would be dangerous. This was on the university campus. It was quite high, so I always had to stand up on my pedals to reach to connect with it. High five! On this occasion, all went textbook, but in the time it took me to put my hand back on the handlebars, my trouser cuff got caught on my chain and I lost my balance. I ended up with the bike on top of me, my foot through the spokes in the f of the front wheel. Yarg! Luckily, I only graze my arms, and no one was around to laugh at me. But I don't tend to high-five trees on my bike anymore. Oh, it's a shame no one saw that. He would have looked like a wally. It's tempting to grab a leaf, isn't it, when you pass an overhanging branch? Oh, yeah, tear a bit of foliage off. Yeah, you or if you're that. passing a bush, to pluck a leaf off, you don't, you roll don't, it between your fingers. You don't go up to a, a, a person and pull out their hair? Yes, why I do. Would, why would you do it to a tree? 
Uh, here's another one. Children love to do that. They love to damage foliage. You really have to explain. Well, it grows back. I know. It's very hard to explain to a child why it's a bad thing just to yank some foliage. I think it depends on the number of uh, leaves on the tree. I mean, if there's lots, then the leaf can spare it. I'm going to make a film all about trees coming to pull your hair out. <laughs> really? Yeah. You don't think trees should be allowed to give joy to a child? Not that they could do other things. <laughs> they can the, hug the them. Hug them. Hug the tree. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Here's one for Joggle and Buxy. Oh yeah, who are they? I don't know. They sound cool. When I, whenever I was very, whenever I was very young, <laughs> it's sort of a way <laughs> every, of that every, to start a message. Every time, <laughs> <laughs> I remember going for a walk with my parents and their friends, who included a minister. I saw what I thought was a very nice stick, which I wanted for my stick collection. <laughs> <laughs> I've got one. I picked it up excitedly and was confused when it squished. Oh! Nature oh, and I oh. have never seen eye to eye since. Fight one last one. That's like the joke, though, isn't it? What's brown and sticky? Yeah, well, not really, because it's not a stick. <laughs> uh, Stephen, a boy man from Dublin. I came home from work on Monday to notice the front door of my house was covered in caterpillars. My girlfriend would not let me get rid of them because she said they would turn into butterflies and it would be, open quotes, lovely, close quotes. Uh, her teacher friend said it would be highly educational to bring them into class to show them turning into butterflies. The next day we got an email from her teacher friend to say that one had exploded into maggots and the <laughs> others were dying. <laughs> exploded into maggots? <laughs> Not the lesson she planned for her seven-year-olds. Yes. <laughs> maggots. <laughs> what are these? <laughs> maggots in, the, in that some of the children got maggots in their eyes and faces <laughs> and the others were dying. <laughs> They're probably being sick while they were dying. <laughs> Awful. Expected something lovely and got a hideous explosion, explosion of maggots and caterpillar vomit. The end. Keep those coming in. <laughs> Text the nation is uh, Nature Wars. Adam and Joe. Six music at bbc.co.uk is the email address. <laughs> it's Johnny King. Oh, yeah. This is. Oh, I've got a story about this as well. This link's going on forever. Yeah, sorry. Um, this, is a, this is a record called Phone Home by Johnny Chingas. Yeah. And I've been trying to figure out what it was called and how to get hold of it for months. And then completely out of the blue. Where'd you hear it first? A listener called Stephen Haywood said, you've been playing early hip-hop and electro, would you consider playing these obscure tracks? I've been trying to search for it. I've been searching Phone Home, I've been searching E.T., and this record hit me hard when I was a kid, because it appears to have the noise of the monster from an American werewolf in London in it. And it also mentions E.T. It's by Johnny Chingus. It's from 1983. It's called Phone Home. Here it is. That's Mr. Johnny Chingas with Johnny Phone Chingas. Home from 1983. Thank Johnny you again Chingas. to Stephen Haywood who helped me track that down. I've been looking for that for years, mate. I didn't know who it was by. And Stephen told me. Good stuff. Next weekend, folks, we are going to be finishing off our little run here at Six Music for the time being at the mighty Glastonbury. We're doing three shows from the festival. We'll be there starting Six Music's coverage at 10 a.m. on Friday morning. So if you're heading to the festival, come and hook up, yeah? But here's an exciting thing. If you are at the festival... Uh, we want to come and see you, or want you to come and see us, more likely. Where, when is this going to be? On the... S Saturday morning. On the Saturday morning. At but for the first half hour of our show, we're going to be out and about. So, so from 10am to 10.30. Exactly. Black Squadron time, basically. If you're at the festival, you come to. if you come to the Pyramid stage... We'll be on the left-hand side. If you're facing the stage to the left, yeah, there's yeah. a little gate. And um, if you go onto the blog, um, which is bbc.co.uk slash blogs slash Adam and Joe, you can find out all those details. Plus, I think we're going to put maybe a little bit of a cheeky Bronholm mask there for you to print out and wear. That might help identify you as a Black Squadron member. We might have a little communal taffin shoutage. What about that? That'll That's be a good fun. idea. Yeah, so to perk you up on that uh, Saturday morning, we hope it'll be a beautiful day. Come and join us. We'll Let's leave you out. details of that liaison on the blog as well. Uh, coming up is Liz Kershaw, so stay tuned for her. She's got Emmy the Great on the show. Didn't realise that. She's going to be live on Liz Kershaw's programme. Thank you so much for listening today. Have a great week, and we'll see you in Glastonbury. We love you. Bye!